In this video, I'm going to go over four separate individual example problems for calculating period, frequency, and current, and the like for an LC oscillating circuits. Before we get started, please don't forget to subscribe to my channel, Step by Step Science. Get all my excellent physics, chemistry, and math videos. When I look at my YouTube analytics, I still see that more than 90% of the people who watch my videos have not subscribed. Please subscribe. Click the notifications bell so you don't miss anything. Give me a thumbs up. Leave me a nice positive comment in the comment section below. And don't forget to share this video. Also, I've made a bunch of other teaching and learning materials, which you can find at my Teachers by Teacher website, where you're looking for example problems, practicing problems with all the solutions, notes, some puzzles, some online labs you can do. All that available at my Teachers by Teacher website. The link is in the description below. Let's get started. This is the first problem. We have an LC oscillating circuit. It's called an LC oscillating circuit because we have an L and a C, an inductor and a capacitor, and we're going to charge the capacitor with this voltage. And it says here the capacitor with the capacitance of 47 microfarads is charged with a 12 volt source. And at time zero, that basically means we're going to flip the switch and the capacitor is going to be charged, discharged through an inductor that has an inductance of 870 nano henrys. And we're going to figure out all these things, determine the period and the frequency of the circuit. We're going to determine the maximum energy stored in the capacitor. We're going to determine the maximum current through the inductor. And we are going to determine the maximum energy stored in the magnetic field of the inductor. Let's get started with number one. We're going to determine the period and the frequency for this LC circuit. And this is the equation we use to calculate the period. T is the symbol for the period, like time, capital T. And it's 2 pi times the square root of L, C, L times C. L is the inductance of the inductor. C is the capacitance of the capacitor. And you get that it's 2 pi, 2 times pi, times the square root of 870 times 10 to the minus 9 henrys, and 47 times 47 times 10 to the minus 6 farads, because that's the capacitance and the inductance is nano is 10 to the minus 9, micro is 10 to the minus 6, and you calculate that and you get 4.0 times 10 to the minus 5 seconds would be the period. Now, we know the period and the frequency are inversely proportional, so the frequency is just simply 1 over the period. 1 divided by 4 times 10 to the minus 5 is going to give us a frequency of just about 25,000 hertz. Okay, that's letter A. Letter B is going to determine the maximum energy stored in the capacitor, and this is the equation we use to calculate the energy in the capacitor. It's WC, energy or work. It's the work done, but we usually say energy of the capacitor is equal to one-half the capacitance of the capacitor times the voltage squared. Don't forget to square the voltage. Once again, the capacitance of the capacitor is 47 times 10 to the minus 6 farads, and we have 12 volts squared, and you get 3.4 times 10 to the minus 3 joules or 3.4 millijoules, just like that. That's the energy stored in the capacitor. And then we're going to get the current, the maximum current, uh, through that circuit. And we are going to use the relationship for conservation of energy because we know, already know that this is the equation for the energy stored in the electric field of the capacitor. And this is the equation stored for the energy. This is the equation for the maximum energy or the energy stored in the uh, magnetic field of the inductor. And we know through conservation of energy, because we're going to say that this is a situation where we have an ideal LC circuit, and there's no energy loss due to resistance within the circuit, internal resistance, that these two values, the maximum energy in the capacitor and the maximum energy in the inductor, are equal, because they're going to be converted back and forth as the circuit oscillates back and forth. So therefore, we, have, we can set those two equal to each other just like that. Okay, now we can cancel our one halves. So we have one half on both sides, and we're left with the capacitance times the voltage squared is equal to the inductance times the current squared. Now we're just going to solve this equation for the current because that's what we want to know. So we're going to divide by the inductance and then take the square root, and that means that the current through that circuit, the maximum current because we're using the maximum voltage, is going to be the square root of the capacitance times the voltage squared divided by the inductance like that. Okay. Okay, now we can do that on the next slide using that same equation, and we simply have to plug our values in because we know the capacitance is still 47 times 10 to the minus 6. The voltage is 12 volts squared. Don't forget to square the voltage. And the inductance is 870 times 10 to the minus 9 henrys like that. And if you do that, you get 88.2 or 88 amperes is the maximum current. Okay, when the 
capacitor is fully discharged. And the magnetic field is at its maximum in the inductor. That's the current. Now, here we want to know the last thing here for this problem is what is the maximum energy stored in the magnetic field of the inductor? And we know, we could have just said, we had the relationship where there's conservation of energy. We're not losing any energy in this ideal LC oscillating circuit. So that means that we already calculated the energy, the maximum energy in the capacitor when it's fully charged is 3.4 times 7 minus 3 joules. And therefore, we know that value. Then we know the, uh, the maximum value for the energy stored in the inductor. Conservation of energy, it's kind of like when you have a pendulum and the pendulum swings back and forth, you know the maximum potential energy at the top and the maximum kinetic energy at the bottom are equal. And therefore, we know that the maximum energy stored in the inductor are 3.4. It's going to be 3.4 times 10 to the minus 3 or 3.4 millijoules. Now, that seems right and that is right, but we could just check it because we know this is the equation for calculating the energy in the inductor and it's just one half times 870 times 10 to the minus 9 henrys, that's the inductance of the inductor, times the current squared. Don't forget to square the current. And you do actually get the same answer just like that. So we're pretty confident that we have this correct and this correct and this correct. It all matches. Good idea just to check it. Okay, that is the end of number one. All right, that's the end of number one. And now we can do number two. Now, number two is basically an extension of number one. Just thought it's a good time to kind of break it up like that. And what we want to do is for the time interval, interval from time is tier, time t is time is zero, t is zero, uh, all the way up to one full period, capital T. We're going to draw the graph of the voltage across the capacitor and the current through the inductor with respect to time. Now I'm going to use uh, the values we got from the previous example, number one. We had a 12 volt source and we calculated the current was 88.2 amperes. And I use that uh, those values for showing the graph. I'm just going to show you up here also how it works out with the electric and the magnetic fields. We have time is zero. We have a quarter period, a half, three quarters, and a full period over here. I'm going to translate that information down here. Now, the way this works out is when, when this starts, uh, the when, when the flip, when the flip is just switched, when the switch is just flipped to position number two, okay, and before we did that, we already charged the capacitor with the electric field and the charges on the plates. And a lot of times when you see in a textbook a diagram like this or a diagram like this, they don't show the charging voltage because it's not part of the actual oscillating oscillating circuit, so to speak, the oscillating oscillating circuit. So, but the time starts when the switch is just flipped, okay, not before and not right, not like sometime afterwards, just when you flip the switch. And just when you flip the switch, okay, the voltage is at its maximum across the capacitor, which is 12 volts, and the current is zero. Well, over the next quarter cycle, over the first quarter cycle, all the capacitor discharges, its energy field collapses, and the energy is then going to be converted into magnetic, into energy in the magnetic field of the inductor, and the current therefore goes to its maximum. All right, and the maximum current we said is 88 volts for this example, and and then the voltage across the capacitor when it's fully discharged goes to zero. So when the capacitor is fully discharged, then the current in the inductor is at its maximum. Okay, they're like opposites, switching opposites. Okay, and that would be the maximum current would be. Uh, 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 88 amperes. This was the axis, y axis, has the current on the voltage, and this has the time on it, like that. Okay? So we converted energy in the capacitor to energy in the magnetic field. And then over the next quarter cycle, we kind of convert it back. And now we have the capacitors charged with the opposite polarity. The current has gone back to zero because the capacitor is fully charged. And when the capacitor is fully charged, minus 12 volts. There's no current. Now, this is minus 12 volts. It doesn't mean it's less than zero. It just means it has the opposite polarity. And you can see the current increases over time and then decreases over time due to the self-induced voltage across that inductor. Okay, It's trying to prevent the current from increasing, and then it's trying to prevent the current from decreasing. So it's not like an increase and then a decrease right away. It increases and decreases over time. Get that nice smooth sine and cosine curve. Okay, over the next quarter cycle, we're going to, again, discharge. I was going to say re-discharge, but probably shouldn't say that. Just discharge the capacitor back to the inductor. The energy goes back to the inductor, and then the voltage across the capacitor goes back to zero. And when the voltage across the capacitor is zero and it's completely discharged, 
then the current is at its maximum and it's at minus 88. The minus 88, the minus sign just means that uh, the current is flowing in the opposite direction. And then we go through one full cycle. When we come back to the capacitor being fully discharged in the original polarity and the current is back at zero. So we have 12 volts and zero amperes and that's the, what we started with over here. And of course that just goes back and forth. As long as we have an ideal situation and we're not losing any energy or you're providing some feedback to keep the capacitor and the energy in the capacitor and the inductor the same. Like that. Okay? Okay. That's number two. Now for number three, uh, we have a capacitor which has a capacitance of 75 nanofarads, and we have an inductor that's going to be placed into that circuit so that the period will be 88, excuse me, 88, 8.8 .8 times 10 to the minus 4 seconds, and we want to know what inductance would we need. All right, so we can just use this same equation, and we're going to solve this equation for L because we know the period, capital T, we know the capacitance of the capacitor, 75 nanofarads, so to do that, we're just going to take the square, we're just going to take the square, we're just going to square both sides to get rid of the square root sign. When we square both sides, the left-hand side, we get t squared, and then we get 4, because 2 squared is 4, and we get pi squared, and we get equal to LC, because when we square the square root of LC, we just get LC. The square and the square root cancel each other. And now we can solve this equation for L by dividing both sides by 4 pi squared C. And you get that L is equal to t squared divided by uh, the period squared divided by 4 pi squared c is the capacitance of the capacitor. And you just plug those values in. The period we said was 88.8 times 10 minus 4 seconds. Don't forget to square that. You get 4 pi squared. And the capacitance of the capacitor is 75 nanofarads. And you get that you would need an inductor of 0. Uh, 0.6261 henrys, which is 261 millihenries like that. And if you combine that capacitance and that inductor, you'll get a period of 8.8 .8 times 10 to the minus 4 seconds. Okay, one more, number 4. This time we're going to be solving for the capacitance. And we have number 4. We have a coil of wire which has an inductance of 7.5 uh, microhenries. And that's going to be placed into an LC circuit. And we want to know what capacitance do we need so that we can have a, a, a frequency of 450 kilohertz. All right. Now, what I like to do with this problem is I like to use uh, the same equation that we used before, so I'm going to convert the frequency to a period, to the period first. You don't have to do this. You could use that the frequency is one, is equal to one over um, two pi LC, square root of LC. But I'm going to get the period, and the period is going to be 2.22 times 10 to the minus 6 seconds. And now I can use this equation again and go through the same process, square both sides, Solve this time for C. Now I'm just going to move everything over to the other side at the bottom, except for the C, of course, the capacitance. So this time we get T squared. The period squared is 4 pi squared L. And capacitance is therefore going to be equal to 2.2 uh, 2 times 10 to the minus 6 seconds squared. That's the period squared. And that's time divided by 4 times pi squared. And then we said that the inductance of that inductor, the coil, is going to be 7.5 times to the minus 6 henrys, and you get that you would need a capacitor that would be 1.67 times 10 to the 8 farads, or 16.7 nanofarads. Okay, so there you go. I think those are some good basic problems for figuring out how LC oscillating circuits work. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed that video. If you did, please do all of the following five things. Of course, the first thing to do is subscribe, support my channel, Step by Step Science. Uh, give me a thumbs up, click the notifications bell, uh, leave me a nice positive comment, and don't forget to share this video. Thank you so much for watching. We'll see you in the next video.